I was going to show a little video on ERCOT um, that I found on ERCOT's website. And instead, I'll, sh I'll share some links after I'm done. Um, um, it was too choppy and um, also too long. Um, and it was boring, but it was really good because it was like, ERCOT's job is to make sure everybody's power stays on. And we were like, yeah. Good job, everybody. So, okay, my name is Chrissy. I um, use she, her pronouns, and I live in Austin, Texas, and I do a ton of work with y'all, with many of y'all in San Antonio, trying to get CPS Energy to clean up their clean up their grid, um, their own personal contribution to the grid, as as a way more accurate um, um, statement, at the, especially today. Um, and so I have a background and I'm kind of a generalist. I have a background in environmental law and, and I've been leaning into energy law and policy recently. And I'm not acting as a lawyer with Sierra Club, but um, that's, that's just my general background. And so I will be looking off screen some because I've got some resources over here. So I apologize if I'm not staring, looking at y'all. Um, but um, in general, I just wanted to say, like, I learned a ton <laughs> over the last three days from from some kind of nonsense people on Twitter and people correcting them um, but also from like energy experts that sort of came out of the woodwork um, some of them I knew um, you know just because I, I I'm on energy nerd Twitter or a lot but others that just like popped up and were just like all over the situation even if they weren't in Texas and so I am I am basically trying I was trying I'm trying to curate in my mind some of that information and present it at a pretty high level so um, I'm going to be frank, there's going to be people on this call that will not learn anything. And there's going to be people on this call that are going to learn a lot. And um, that's okay. And um, if you have more in the weeds conversation or questions, like put it in there. And if it doesn't seem like the right forum for it, and I totally will engage with you later or um, or whatever. And don't ever feel like your question is too simple or too high level um, because it, it totally isn't. Like I just said, I, I more or less practice or, or work around this universe and I and I have like doubled my, tripled my my knowledge of this, some of this stuff. Um, what I wanna start off by sharing is that this was super unprecedented. Some of the stuff that Gianna was sharing, was um, guiding us through about how we're all connected. Like, through water and through the space that we share. Um, this this is really big. This is a big thing that happened. And it's sometimes hard to see how big a thing that was happening through our own little individual prisms. Um, but, you know, you'll catch like, oh, you know, this guy I work with in San Antonio, or I'm sorry, in Houston that, that you know, chimes in on the regional haze rule is on CNN, right? Like, this is a big deal. And it's also like this really, um, to me, this pivotal moment because we're um, we're all in, more or less being impacted in very similar ways. Like not me the same as Eloise, Eloise for example, because um, I just got lucky and had more power. But and I don't and I don't share that. I don't have the same you know history, but. But I mean, like across Texas or across the folks that were impacted. This is unusual. Harvey hits Houston and decimates Houston. And we're all like, we feel that and we go help as soon as we can. But we weren't impacted the same way. This is incredible. And um, I don't want to be all Pollyanna. We can find some silver lining. But I do feel really connected to people through this like sort of shared experience and shared trauma to some, ex some extent that I think like maybe some sort of tipping point um, for us getting stuff done. Um, anyway, so those, that was just like my personal reflection and like hearing some of the stuff that y'all were sharing. I was like, yeah, this feels really different um, and um, a real shared experience that I hope we never have again, but I think some good can come out of it. Um, okay. So Greg um, indicated that I was going to provide like a ton of information. I'm going to start with um, what happened. Well, actually, I'm going to take like a hand, a hands poll. We won't use the poll feature, but do people would people prefer like here's how the how it's set up, like ERCOT, the Public Utility Commission, state legislature, all of that, and then talk about what happened, or would we, um, or do we just want to get into the meat of what we think tripped off and did wrong, and um, so yeah, some regulatory background, some like hands laying up. the groundwork. Hands up for which one? Hands up for laying the groundwork. So we got brief set up. Okay, first option, great. I see two. Okay, 
Hands up. Okay, cool. Okay. I'm going to do some real basic um, setup. And Greg alluded to some of this earlier. And this is what I've been sort of railing about. So we've seen the governor go on Sean Hannity and point fingers at um, windmills and at, <laughs> and at ERCOT. And then we just hear, and for a lot of people, this is the first time they've ever heard about ERCOT. And that's for good reason, because usually they do their job. Um, and this is not a finger pointing, especially if you're the governor, a finger pointing opportunity. And here's why. So ERCOT basically runs as an independent, like a nonprofit. And they, they are set up by the state of Texas. So the buck stop, should stop with the executive, the chief executive of the state of Texas, who is Governor Abbott. Um, and instead, he's just sort of mad that the company he hired didn't do the thing he wanted him to do, which was keep the power on. Right. But here's the deal. So ERCOT isn't brand new. ERCOT has been around for, um, oh, since the 70s, 1970, maybe. And um, it was set up to be a reliable, basically a reliability entity for the state of Texas to run, run. And I, I'll, I'll use my state of Texas in air quotes to run the grid that encompasses most of the state of Texas. But it wasn't set up like, like by divine intervention. The state legislature decided the rules. They decided what they wanted. Um, the Public Utility Commission oversees much of what ERCOT does. There are, um, and they set, you know, they set standards that ERCOT then has to go implement. And in, in many ways. And um, so like the folks at the Public Utility Commission don't usually get into the weeds on, say, like weather modeling because they expect ERCOT to do that properly. Right. Um, so um, but it is it is a, you know, it is over. It is off to the side, but overseen by the Public Utility Commission. The governor. This is one of our commissions. Most of our commissions are have governor appointees and um, let me turn off my phone. Um, and this is one of them. So all three of the, the these commissioners were appointed by um, Governor Abbott. All the ones before that had been appointed by Governor Perry. And um, that's the case for a lot of commissions, not the Railroad Commission, which we'll talk about maybe in a little bit. But um, so like the governor has direct authority over the commissioners effectively that are implementing the rules that the legislature writes that set up the grid that ERCOT now runs. And so what I've been telling people is ERCOT's running the very grid that they told them to, they created and using the rules that the, either the legislature or the PUC came up with. And ERCOT has its own um, governmental structure with lots of committees and subcommittees and working groups. And we don't really need to get into that right now. Um, but I think it's just important to understand like this, cannot all just come down at the feet of the folks running the grid the way the way Abbott's trying to make make it out. Um, the Public Utility Commission is constantly like overseeing, asking ERCOT to participate. And, and so at worst case, they're partners and most more, I think a more accurate description is the Public Utility Commission provides regulatory oversight for for um, much of ERCOT's dealings. Um, yeah. So what is ERCOT? ERCOT is both the entity, um, so the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, but it's also what we call the grid itself. Um, um, and so let me see if I can share a, something. Um, so ERCOT is uh, most of the state of Texas. It is a grid that en encompasses businesses, homes, you name it within this, I would call it a service territory, something like CPS has. And, um, let me find it. And sorry, I'm pausing so I can get this up. So I've got this fact sheet, um, and a bunch of other tabs up too, but, and I'll share this fact sheet, but I just wanted to really share this picture in case y'all hadn't seen it before. And it's a little, um, just a little graphic here. Like this is this is the state of Texas. Obviously, everything in dark blue is where ERCOT ser has is effectively serving. So if you're if you're um, a home in there, a business in there, then that means you you're being served by an ERCOT serving entity. Um, you could uh, you could have a power company like a like a generating plant outside of that area, and they could have transmission into that area, and um, so you can generate power out of it and and transmit power into it, but you cannot 
as long as you're in the state of Texas, well, I guess anywhere, but you can't also like, um, like go the opposite way, not always. So for example, and if, can y'all see my little cursor here? Um, okay, so that little cursor more or less is around the Longview area and there's a coal plant out there called Martin Lake. It is a, um, it's a coal plant that um, is an ERCOT plant. It produces power and they transmit it into the dark blue area, but it's outside there. It's outside the um, service territory of ERCOT. So um, did you share the URL, Greg? Is that what you're doing? Great. So um, anyway, this is really just to show you this map. It's, it's most of Texas. Um, you can see El Paso is out there. They're in a different, um, they're, they're not in ERCOT. Texas still regulates part, the Public Utility Commission that I mentioned earlier regulates the Texas customers that are served by um, the El Paso Electric Utility that, um, that serves this area. These gray areas up here, different um, grid called the Southwest Power Pool, and they, and they encompass this area up here, and then some of this area over here, and then also like a ton of plain states. And the Public Utility Commission oversees those, the the things that impact the Texas customers for those utilities. And then down here is one called um, MISO, the Mid Atlantic Inter um, Independent System Operator. And um, they, um, they share territory with like Louisiana. And for the Texas customers, again, the Public Utility Commission oversees things that impact them. So that's basically like, we can get into more details there, but um, if, if, if people are interested, but this is sort of the ERCOT is m this big grid in the or this big service territory in the middle. There are these parts outside of it, are outside of it that are still within Texas and um, the Public Utility Commission oversees that. But ERCOT is famously only within Texas, doesn't transmit power very often and not under federal or regulatory authority outside of the state and neither does it import it very often. And so that is sort of the long and short of why it's a Texas only grid. Everyone's real proud of it or used to be, they were in, you know, a week ago. And it, it's also why they're not subject, right. They're not subject to federal regulation. And so um, anyway, that's really, that's really how that works. And so basically that's been the case since 1970 and within, within these areas were different um, uh, utilities. So the way we think about CPS energy, that used to be kind of all of ERCOT. There were service territories within ERCOT where you had a per, an entity that you paid your, your light bill to who was responsible for trans, getting you power, was responsible for generating you power for the most part. That's not the case for most of ERCOT anymore. Um, most of ERCOT is deregulated and is in the competitive market. And that means that um, generators kind of vie against generators and they're in there to make money and it's uh, it's about making money. And they deregulated it in 1990. They voted to deregulate it in 1999. It was subsequently deregulated it, deregulated. And um, and that's how we ended up with the more or less with the market we have today. People entities that were exempt included municipal utilities and co-ops. So there are still in this so-called deregulated wholesale market, there are areas that are, you don't get a choice of who your electric provider is. And anyone on this call that's in, that pays their bill to CPS is in one of those places. I'm also in one of those places because I live in Austin Energy service territory. If some folks live in Pertinalis co-op territory, same thing. So um, yeah, so that's broadly how it works. We've, um, this will be really important later when we talk about one day or later today, like what does that mean for how CPS intersects with the grid? And like, why did you have to lose power if the, you know, the gas plants out in West Texas weren't doing their job? So um, yeah, and so a couple of other things about ERCOT, just facts about their, um, what they're supposed to do, they're, they have, they describe that they have four main responsibilities. And if Greg shared this fact sheet, you can see that at the top, this fact sheet happened before the, the blackouts. They maintain system reliability. They facilitate a competitive wholesale market. They facilitate, facilitate a competitive retail market. And those are your retail providers that you would choose, like you're choosing like a cell phone package or something else. That's how the retail electric providers work. And, um, 
And so um, you get to choose from a whole menu of options there. And then, um, and they, and they also ensure open access to transmission and that's the generators. They allow generators, power, power um, providers. So coal plants, nuke plants, gas plants, wind, wind farm, solar, and eventually battery um, access to the transmission grid and, and, and they loads and then load serving entities. So like who is serving like our houses and businesses access to it. So that's their goal. And it's, um, it's all about balancing how much power is coming on, how much power is coming off and um, ensuring that that, and that's about the reliability aspect. And then facilitating the market part is another separate, another separate thing that they do, which is also very complex. So that's again, pretty big picture. While I'm talking about the um, reliability and how much power comes on and how much power comes off, the Dallas Morning News today is reporting that we were minutes or seconds away from a total system failure. Like it may have felt like for many of y'all that we had a total system failure. We did not. It could have been much, much worse. And the reason for that is that generators were failing so rapidly that ERCOT was having a hard time reducing demand. And so, and so when that happens, um, the frequency that has to be maintained on the grid, um, gets out of whack and that's when it'll just, it'll create a system that, or create uh, a situation where the entire, the entire system can go down. And so you might have seen that, like we had total system failures. We've seen it in like the East coast blackouts in summer of 2003 and um, which I ironically was in. So I've now been in two. I was visiting New York. I, I had finished um, law school and a, a good friend of mine and I just went up there to screw around in New York City. And we were, we happened to be there for that blackout. We were in an elevator. And um, as the elevators were closing, like the blackout happened. And we were at the, we were at the Met and everyone, like all the security guards lost their mind and they like pried the, pried the elevator open and shoot us out. And um, we didn't understand what was happening until it's been a few minutes and we were like, oh, this is historic. Look at us. Okay. So um, side note. So yeah, so this is what they have to do is in balance demand with um, with power coming on and power coming off. And when that gets, and that's why they have to, they have to keep that stable and they can't let it, um, they can't let it vary too much. So second side note, that's also why there's a lot of complaints about renewables because they can't, it is sometimes more challenging to get that mate to maintain that but it's all it's all fixable and it's been fixed ERCOT's actually done a really good job finding ways to integrate renewables into a grid that wasn't designed for them necessarily but we've we've been able to integrate that with, with technology so um yeah so that's very broadly on ERCOT they have you know we've seen their CEO up there talking about what they're, what they've been trying to get done. Um, so if we want to know like, all right, so this sounds like there's a bunch of smart folks who've been running this grid just fine. What happened next? That's, we can start talking about that next, but I want to pause here and um, see if a, that made much sense to folks if people had some follow-up questions and yeah. So I'll just open it up or let Greg open it up. It, um, I think about, maybe a good shift. I mean, I, I think one thing that if I hear you saying is that the way the market is designed is designed, I think about like plants being built cheaply, you know, like, so gas plants don't have to have like super insulation to make sure that they're prepared for extreme weather. Right. So like there's things that have happened at a structural level that made us more vulnerable. Um, but I assume you're going to talk about like the 89 and 11 blackouts and when nothing happened, right, <laughs> to fix it. Yeah, I can at least talk about 2011 a little bit. But yeah, I think I think that like broad takeaway on how market participants interact in in ERCOT is that it's it's meant to be as open as free market as possible. Honestly, so there is regulation. I would say on the consumer protection side of things, as much as much as Texas is comfortable doing. Um, and that, those are the retail electric providers, right? I mentioned those other ones. Those are the folks that you get to choose your provider. And so there's some real sh shady ones, but there, there's um, not all that much of a barrier to entry to become a retail electric provider. 
Um, there are protections though, and so they do have some barriers to entry. And they have regulations and they, they the PUC um, looks goes through and, and it does enforcement on bad regulate on um, bad retail electric providers. Likewise, if you have a market for a generator, so a power generator, we'll, we'll choose a gas plant um, that is um, gaming the system one way or another, um, the PUC can enforce. And so again, big picture, this is like just reflects like the PUC has its hands in the ERCOT cookie jar all over the place. They can regulate, they can, they can ask for, you know, reports and, and, and figure out how to enforce, to create more stability and reliability in the system. And they do it all the time. They think about it all the time. They thought about things like a capacity market, which we can talk about next, which would be creating a market of reserves that we all pay for all the time, even though they're not being used. Hot tip, we don't love them at Sierra Club because we see them propping up gas in other markets. Anyway, um, so back in 2011, where um, we had an unprecedented, previously unprecedented polar vortex event, it was um, Super Bowl week slash weekend. And because I was living in Dallas, this is maybe I'm bad luck for this stuff actually, but, and um, I was working at EPA at the time and like this crazy snows came and there were blackouts and I don't remember them impacting me because I think they did a better job rolling them because it wasn't so like, it didn't go all the way down to Brownsville, right? It was, it was um, unprecedented, but it wasn't this unprecedented. And so um, after that, they were like, oh crap, we were not prepared for weather this cold. And so there were studies and there were reports and some of the recommendations, lo and behold, were you really should, generators should be required to weatherize because the generators, you know, fuel froze up or their systems didn't properly operate in temperatures this cold. And um, the, the, what came out of that was um, the PUC required um, annual reports about it and they, had recommended effectively best practices, but nothing enforceable. And so that's where we ended up. And so we can talk about, and I think looking at 2011 is probably uh, the best, because it's so recent and we have some of the same people still in decision-making um, places at ERCOT and definitely at the state legislature and staff at the PUC that have been around for that long that you know we don't have to jog our memory that hard and so um yeah they just didn't do what they could have done because and presumably because generators complained that it would cost too much and it would be so unlikely that they would need that that generation and so and um yeah so that's like that's what happened after 2011. we've gone through this once before on a much smaller scale we had blackouts they were rolling and texans do not even like rolling blackouts never mind being out you know, in dangerous weather for 36 hours or more and, um, or 48 hours. And we've seen 80, 80 plus hours in parts of Austin at least. Um, but yeah, so they had a real opportunity to do something about it and did not And th this is one of these places where we're like, we got to hold that, like get to hold people accountable right then and there. Cause again, this is impacting so many more people. And I saw that this is going to be the largest insurance claim event in the history of Texas. And that's, and that's nuts. We've been hit by how many category five hurricanes? Um, but this impacted just so many of us at such a grand scale that um that this is this is what we're gonna end up with. So um yeah. Um what else can I say? You well, you mentioned that word accountability. Yeah. Let's go there. Let's talk about accountability. Um, who should be accountable? Well, we, I know folks have been complaining about their local energy providers. Um, my case, and I've heard it in, C in San Antonio too, people are like throwing snowballs and rocks at the linesmen. Don't do that. Obviously those linesmen have nothing to do with who is getting their black, who's getting turned on or off. They're just literally like out there de-icing lines and all of that. So like, they're not the ones accountable. Um, if there's some jack, you know, jackals out there cutting lines, yeah, okay, but that's not what's happening. These guys are risking, generally guys are risking their lives to be out there and um, take care of people. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's really too bad. And more than too bad, that's just like people are, have this misplaced anger and frustration. So, okay, what's the next step up? Is it our, is it Paula? Is it Jackie here in Austin? Maybe. 
um maybe on some limited basis and so we heard earlier today there was some conversation about like well what what decisions are are and we need to think about cps in this case as a transmission utility and the reason i said that is say that is because it's really about how they're implementing what ERCOT is requiring them to do so um, one one more step back. We talk, I talk about ERCOT and how we have these different um, you know ways to participate. I, and I neglected to mention there are there's this other party and it's our other participant. And it's the utilities that run the transmission lines. They're really important. ERCOT regulates them. ERCOT regulates them and and they make sure that their transmission lines are up to snuff. They make sure that they have these anti, you know, that they can keep them clean, of, clear of vegetation. They decide whether or not they get to get built at all and how much, because that cost is socialized amongst all, everybody, all of us pay for transmission all over the state. And, um, and that's, you know, not something that many Texans probably understand or would like on first blush, maybe all of us on this call would, but, um, but it's really good because what it means is, what it should mean rather is that adequate adequate transmission gets built all across the ERCOT grid so that we can get power from South Texas to North Texas when North Texas gets a polar vortex that doesn't hit you know south of San Antonio because we got a lot of wind generation down south but if there's congestion in other words if their grids can't get that energy flowing up and down or east and west then um, that's a problem and ERCOT should fix that and maybe they do a generation study, but the PUC in the end gets to make the decision on whether or not to um, authorize any particular utility, um, transmission utility to build that line. And um, there are, I talked about service territories, other, um, there are service territories for transmission utilities. Um, so everything is, not everything is truly competitive within ERCOT. What's competitive is generators um and whole and pricing and things like that but a transmission utility they get their money back they get a return on investment they want to put more steel in the ground and they would love i i will speak for them they would love to build transmission out the wazoo and texas and get as much transmission out there and reduce as much congestion as possible and it's up to the puc to balance that sort of like that desire to put that much steel in the ground with um with how what it's going to cost and whether or not it's necessary and that's the reliability aspect. And so ERCOT plays a role in that because they do studies about that. So anyway, so there are utilities, people that are right, entities that are regulated by ERCOT, I'm sorry, by the Public Utility Commission in a certain, like for rates and those costs get passed on to us and our bill and our, you know, our electric bills. But those are regulated at ERCOT and they come in for rate increases and they come in for all the kinds of things that we've heard about. But they're also the entities that are responsible for, um, for load, for, for making sure that enough power is getting into their little area and that it, um, that to serve their, their needs. And so they're the entities that were required during these blackouts. Once ERCOT said, oh no, we are not getting enough power on to serve all of the demand. ERCOT told the each individual um, utility, transmission utility, you have to get rid of this much demand. You have to shed this much load. So say it, we'll just use units of 10. You have a, you know, you have to shed 10 units of load, 10 units of electric power. And um, that means 10%, and if you have 100 units of demand, that means you have to shed 10% of your load. And so, yeah, sure, Alex, in just a second. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's it. Everyone got instructions at sort of that very like base, like very foundational, like CPS energy for your service territory that you have transmission responsibility for, you have to get rid of X percentage of your load. And it was up to CPS Energy to do that rapidly and in compliance with what ERCOT said. But ERCOT didn't tell them who to turn on and off. That was up to them. And so, um, and ERCOT didn't tell them like how they should, you know, manage energy of, or um, demand response. That was up to them. Um, so some, some places did it better than others, quite frankly. And so like the co-ops outside of Austin, I know for sure they were rolling their blackouts. They were maybe maybe it was really inefficient and they should check on that because my friends were getting 20 minutes on 20 minutes off that doesn't sound right either that doesn't sound very useful and people in austin we were told the following i think you were told this as well okay ERCOT told us we got rid of x amount of load to do that we have to cut every non-critical right circuit 
critical non not every circuit that doesn't have critical infrastructure on it we have to cut it and we once we did that we didn't have any more to cut and we couldn't roll them so there wasn't like some circuits that had power that didn't have critical infrastructure so they could roll the blackouts they were just like there's no we have no more load to give and we have no more circuits available to to roll the blackouts through and so we're just stuck here um i think that's what cps told folks too and um but that just wasn't happening in other places it actually makes sense to me and we can talk about that a little bit but um yeah anyway alex had a question yeah, I think actually in the question side okay. Uh, okay, that cool. Alan wanted to ask about coal, if CPS was running their coal plants throughout 100%, do you know about that? And then uh, I think uh, then Alex is on stack. Sure. Um, I asked, and Russell had a little, Russell pinged me other earlier. He has a little thing to say about that. But um, it is at this point, we can't, like, it's not real obvious, like, which units were coming on and off like that data wasn't available. I was asking for that. And so it wasn't available at that granular level. Like I can't go fact check, um, like whether or not Spruce was running and what it could at what level it was running. I'll be able to tell that. We'll be able to know that soon enough, but not right now. Um, Russell said that Paula in a briefing to um, the council, the yeah, mentioned that Spruce may, one of the units at Spruce may have switched to gas. So, Again, we'll be able to figure some of that out soon. And um, what what's important is, like, we know that of the load um, of the generation that should have been available, 30 gigawatts of gas, coal, or nukes weren't. 30 gigawatts is over is nearly half of the entire ERCOT capacity mark or capacity that was should have been available. That's incredible. And for all of that to fail at one time, like it makes sense. It doesn't feel right. It makes sense like, oh yeah, I can see how that would really screw up the the grid and how they were really close because those generation assets were full, those power power plants were falling offline very rapidly and with very little warning. So um Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. share. I know Alex is, is is coming up, but before we got onto this kind of public portion of the call, we were having kind of like a conversation about you know, how do, how do we organize? How do we message? How do we take action? What are solutions based, you know? And, and one of the big ones is gonna be around strong energy efficiency measures, conservation, keeping people safe in their homes, right? And there is a program here. If folks wanna learn more about that, it's kind of like a follow-up call. I think we should talk about um, the uh, local options there, but uh, can we shift over to Alex's question? Are you good? Are you? I am. What I just want to note that Alan didn't. I didn't note see the second half of his question. Did they make a lot of money? Probably yes. If they had money to sell into the market, they made a ton of money. But they were. I think when we hear their um, how proud they are of how much money they made, we need to push back and say like, well, these were not reliable. It could have been you, and you could have been on the hook for so much more money. And just because you came out on the on the on the hot side of this, on the good side of this, doesn't mean that next time you won't come out on the other side. So um, particularly if like a cold snap hits weirdly South Texas, but not West Texas, or lingers in South Texas, or if we get a dang hurricane and it comes up and straight hits San Antonio, but you know Dallas is fine. Like we're not going to look so good if they have to buy a ton. Um, so that isn't the reason to keep that isn't the reason to keep spruce in my opinion but go ahead alex yeah thanks chrissy i'm going to okay. potentially botch this uh question um but two things i was seeing uh that i saw repeated that seemed central to understanding what took place is i think the acronym is the sava that is the the kind of as i understand it a survey of of you know peak moments in the system, like peak hot days. And, you know, we tend to calculate for that versus extreme cold weather. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the failures of that survey to account for particular nadirs like the ones that we just saw um, and, and how to rectify that? I think the language is, you know, a capacity market versus, uh, you know, whatever the other end of that binary is, I, I saw some exchanges about that. But, um, and then the second piece of it is at the at the 
the ERCOT level, when, when generators are getting instructions at the ERCOT level, uh, how, do the, how do the generators interact with one another? How do the utilities interact with one another? Are there, are there bad incentives at that level where, you know, ERCOT, is it, is it asking everybody to reduce load equally? Is it asking everybody to reduce load based on the customers? How is that instruction coming down? Uh, do, we, do, we, do we know a lot about that? Okay, um, let me answer that second one first because I, I might need you to repeat the first one. It's a little complex. So, um, okay, so the power generators operate in ERCOT um, under two ways. They can decide whether or not to produce power to sell into the grid. So there are um, market, like the price, there's a kind of a spot and if there's any experts on here, I'm already going to apologize for how rough and janky this is going to be. But basically, there's like a spot market in ERCOT, um, and and they and it's like whatever the price is selling at, whatever power is selling at, um, might influence whether influence whether or not a generator even produces power. So let's just choose a middle of the road kind of day, and um, say power is selling at thirty dollars per megawatt hour. At $30 per megawatt hour, many, many coal plants cannot put power on their grid and make money. They might do it for other reasons, but just from a basic price standpoint, they're not going to make money. So, like, why bother? So, they may not run or they may only run enough to, like, to put because they're, they're waiting for, you know, that, that heat wave in the afternoon, say, say they're expecting one and, and it's late May and it's a little weird, but they, they think the, the weather comes out They're, They might have powered up and wait for it. Um, so that is generally how generators make this decision on whether or not to produce power to sell to the grid. There are some that will always put power on the grid because they can't really choose solar and wind are good examples. Nuclear sometimes, um, or usually, um, hydro, whatever. So these renewables, they're just producing whatever they're producing. It's not, they're not usually turned off or whatever. And they produce power and they might bid in crazy low, right? Because wind is effectively free because there's no fuel. They have to recover their costs or whatever. There's no fuel cost. And so they'll just always, they'll bid in crazy low so that they're always called up to the um, grid. So wind gets called up and, and maybe, you know, maybe it's in the middle of the night and um, power prices are really low and wind is getting called up and they're making, and it's, there's a ton of wind. And so there's a lot of wind on the grid. So we've seen some of this where like at night an ERCOT will have like 50% plus wind in um, producing power because nobody else wants to. The gas plants certainly don't want to. They're not making any money. And maybe some of the coal plants are just producing enough. And then the nukes are probably producing. And then, of course, no solar. So, like, it's a decision. And here's the really interesting thing that I think is super screwy and may have, like, and I don't know what it did to the reliability of the grid. And this is my big question. is like, because fuel, as the cold was, was coming and it was single digits, because these gas plants make a decision to um, participate in the market based on whether or not they can make money. Um, and this is before ERCOT becomes like big brother and says, you don't have a choice produce because ERCOT can do that. But before that happens, um, there has to be a price point where it makes sense. So gas prices have to be sufficiently low and power wholesale prices have to be su sufficiently high. They have to be able to get gas at a certain, and so there's two markets that intersect there. And I'm totally learning about this in the last two or three days. Um, there's the gas spot market because these gas power plants don't have these firm contracts that we're used to hearing about with um, coal. Like, you know, CPS has a coal contract and a bunch of coal comes down a rail and it shows up and they know how much it is and they know how to burn it and yada, yada. Um, gas, they're just pulling off it's dispatchable. It's all these great things. It's so flexible, right? And they pull it out of the pipeline when they need it and they do it when the price is right and they sell it when they can make money. They sell power when they can make money. And um, those things didn't line up right for this storm because while that was happening, while they were like, oh, you know, it's getting cold, prices are going, power prices are going up, gas um, prices were also going up because. Everyone was kicking on their heaters. Everyone was using all their power, um, all their gas power, gas home heating. And also there were firm contracts for that. So like there was a lot of what was available was already taken up 
And then what wasn't, what wasn't already called, you know, somebody's name on it was already called, you know, um, called for was became less and less available because the weather was freezing wellheads. And so while that was happening, so there was scarcity pricing on the gas market, there was scarcity pricing on the power market, but they didn't line up. So when like the prices at, um, on the power market were climbing, 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 they weren't climbing as fast as the, as the gas prices. And so these power, these gas power generators didn't have any economic incentive to just go ahead and start producing because they would have hemorrhaged money or they, I guess they were worried about that. So that is part of what happened. I don't know how much that impacted it, but that's one of my big questions is like, what kind of incentives should they, should have already been in place if we're going to continue with this market um, to ensure that doesn't happen and di didn't happen and doesn't happen again. So I hope that answered your question about how the generators like decide to produce because it is completely up to them. Yeah, it definitely did. I appreciate okay. that. And then the, yeah. the the other part, like I said, I was I was confident that I would botch it, but the other no, part okay. is that I think the acronym is SABA, but it's the survey yeah. that they yeah. do every the seasonal months. the seasonal report, right? Yeah. 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 How does that, so how does yeah. That so. That's a good question. So um, ERCOT does a couple of things. So they do these seasonal um, like outlooks and they they predict when they do that, they do a summer. I think they do shoulder seasons too, but we'll just talk about um, summer and winter. They do a summer and they do a winter. And in general, in Texas, our peak demand, we're a summer peaking state. Um, the Northeast is typically like winter peaking, right? Um, they're going to use more power in their homes in the winter. For all the things they also by the way have a lot of um fuel heating like gas and oil um so but texas has never been a winter peaking state but we um we do have a winter peak it's just usually a lot lower than the tech the summer peak so um i'm gonna i'm gonna just wing it i the summer peak 78,000 megawatts ish the winter peak before this one in the mid 60s they had pe they had predicted like a 68,000 megawatt peak or 66,000 again totally winging it um and it hit like 68 so we were 2500 megawatt 2500 megawatts off um for this last for this event that wasn't it i mean so and they predict those peaks based on the weather and the predicted weather and then also based on and then they do this other thing which is basically a worst case scenario right and they grossly under predicted our worst case scenario um in two ways they they kind of under predicted like how much demand there would be but they grossly under predicted the availability of all those generators i just talked about they did not come up with the scenario that happened in their modeling so these um these reports so this is how they determine whether or not we have enough um um you know, reserves in the generation mix to provide for the likely demand. And so um, that is, that's, that's, and what that does is it gives um, cues to whether or not like a gas power plant wants to build in, like a developer wants to build a gas power plant. They look at that report and they say, oh, well, it looks like they're going to be, there's going to be a tight reserve margin for these years. And it makes sense for me to get um, another power plant online because I'll make a lot of money. Or you've heard, um, you've heard in Paula Williams at CPS talk about that too. Like, oh, we like to have this really comfortable reserve margin, and we have so much. We've been providing extra for that for all of ERCOT because it was tight for a couple of years, and those reserve margins are getting bigger and bigger because more wind and solar is coming online. Um, so that all those reserve margins are calculated based on those seasonal reports that you that you're talking about, Alex. And what that means is um, that helps them model like based on the weather based on other things like what plants they expect to be down what generation assets are actually available at any one time it's very common in texas to bring plants down in the shoulder seasons or the winter because they don't think they're going to need them maybe gas plants go offline um and what ERCOT does have the ability to do is see like a, a weather event coming and get those generators back online by telling them you need to be available and um that may cost money that gets so again socialized but it is something they have ability to do 
Was that helpful? I, I want to just point out it was just a little after 7.50. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple thoughts on San Antonio, but I want to make sure other people on the call are getting what they need from you with the particular information that you have first. So I want to pause here for a minute for other folks on the call. Okay. Um, I don't know if you had if you had someplace you wanted to go with that right now, Chris, or if I'm interrupting, but I do, uh, I could kind of like localize a little bit in this way. Um, obviously, this is something for San Antonio um, and for our bioregion, for our watersheds, for our people in this area that were responsible to, that obviously goes global, right? But for speaking for our service territory, and to use Chrissy's, to use that term for CPS, um, there's a lot of things happening, you know, that, that and there's a lot of things we can do to make sure that this never happens again. Um, and to know if you're not tied in with the energy justice uh, conversation, debate, struggle, understand a couple of things. And I'm just You're muted, Greg. Did I just mute myself right now? Or I don't have to do all that again, do I? Um, uh, that CPS has a put out for the very first time a report on the potential or, or to get off of coal, right? Um, because we all know that what we're facing, what we're experiencing is a manifestation of climate crisis, um, uh, to name that. Uh, it doesn't always come in the way that we expect or manifest in the ways that make linear sense sometimes. Um, but basically, we got the Arctic's weather, right? Um, and at the same time, the, the power sources that people in Texas historically prided themselves on, coal and gas and nuclear, failed, right? Um, and so we've been pushing CPS since before they even built the coal plant we have operating right now. We got one shut down a couple of years ago, and now we've got spruce. Uh, and we've been fighting for a long time to get CPS to share data to show us, you know, so we can start planning a way off of spruce. We know we can't turn it off tomorrow because we obviously we are responsible to one another. And that's, you know, we, we need the power. People need to keep their medical devices on. There's all kinds of things that come out of like these sharp interruptions like this. But we want to be able to plan with CPS a way off of coal into better, you know, cleaner uh, sources. Uh, so that's happening. The problem is, and I put the link in there to CPS's report. The problem is the 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 scenarios they're running and they're they're telling people about are false, uh, are uh, are seem to be ordered. Their assumptions seem to be created to make renewables look impractical and expensive. So that's down there. Um, right under that is if anybody's interested in volunteering, participating. We've also fought for and got now manifesting this ratepayer advisory committee, which part of that charge is to look at the who's being charged, how much money uh, for energy in San Antonio, and hopefully reform that, get equity in rate setting uh, with the intention of bringing on more renewable power to decarbonizing San Antonio and the grid. So that's uh, there's a link there to CPS's page check that out and if you're interested in volunteering interested in serving let people on this call let me my emails on here higher up let anybody know and it'll filter through i'm working with Didi. i'm working with deanna i'm working with others chrissy um to bring those folks forward to the attention of council so that's happening now uh i, I had to add you know my take on what's going on is at the deceleration link um that's what i wanted to share there's comments in from roxana uh, rojas um chrissy do you want to go through the comments um there's a question there for follow -up. your email can you put your email on there for follow-up questions uh roxana says my family and i are on the south side of san antonio we were without power for over 26 hours with it coming on for two to five minutes once every few hours and i wonder along what lines we decided how to section off customers um we we were talking about that earlier tonight actually also and how do we does it how do we distinguish between cps's responsibilities and that of like the air caught and the market and the big things and the governor um cps had to load shed to use their language had to give had to had to cut a certain amount of energy in response to air cost request but how they did it if i understand correctly or we were talking about earlier was up to cps 
And there's other people on this call who are like out for 36 hours, other people, you know, having these kinds of experiences. Uh, and that's a huge, huge bear of a question and has and it has to be answered. Um, what else is on here? Other questions? I'll, 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 I'll cut now. I'll check now. But uh, Chrissy or whoever else. Um, I'm just glancing through. Um, I see Julian's comment that I don't know if Julian's still with us, but um, the system's based on greed. DRAG never lowered anyone's bills. The market rationale was always about profit and greed. Um, I would comment that the, the deregulation market lowered wholesale prices. So that doesn't necessarily mean it lowered your 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 bills or my bills, um, but they definitely lowered wholesale prices because we have some of the cheapest wholesale. Um, power in the country, um, notwithstanding these last few days. So um, that is, I'm not disputing what Julian is saying. I am just saying they definitely, we have some of the lowest wholesale prices in part because gas prices, gas plummeted and all of that. So, um, and we built wind and we built it fast. So who benefits from that is the, is the next takeaway from like, from that reality. Um, let's see. I don't have any other, like, I am happy to answer more questions. I'm actually, if you want us, I'm not like trying to get people to stay on longer, but if you have more questions, we can do q and I'm here, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> like, where am I gonna go? <laughs> so um, if you have any more questions, I'm happy to, to chat, um, any bit longer. Yeah, I would say if you put your email into the chat. Yeah, it's uh, we in can there. Yeah. Or not you, but anybody on this call, if you want to follow up on these conversations, having more of these conversations. I know folks are connected with SWU and other other groups, but we can uh, organize more. You know, if there's town halls or particular speakers or or topics people want to bring in, um, uh, maybe put your your email there or mine is higher up. Contact me or Chrissy. Darby had a question about how much CPS was running. I don't know right now. Um, as, as, um, Russell notes and others have noted, um, STP, one of the nuke units came down like as a fail safe. There wasn't a, an incident as far as I know. Um, yeah. And so, and that unit was a more or less a little bit smaller than all of, um, than Spruce one and two combined. So, which is a 13 something megawatts. So, um, sorry, 1300 something megawatts. Um, and so that's that's interesting to think about, right? We we generally rely on those, and but the difference is STP is owned by three entities, and Spruce is owned just by CPS. So, um, yeah, I we'll find out. Like a lot of these, we'll get these answers, Darby. Like how much how much they were, what what was the impact? Because if one of those coal units had to run on gas, they weren't producing the same power. They can't produce gas. They can't produce power as efficiently from gas as they can from coal. So. No, that'll be the same case if they ever convert one to gas. It will not be the same kind of plant. So, um, okay. Meredith asks, distinguish wholesale customers from businesses that want a big discount. Um, so businesses are still going to generally have to buy from some sort of, you know what? I'm not 100% sure. But if you're, say, like uh, a business that's in a service territory, like, uh you know, for who CPS, you would pay, they would pay their bill to CPS, then they would be a customer of CPS um, versus the wholesale price market when like um, the re like a retail electric provider. So like CPS can buy power from the market, right? And they would pay the wholesale price. So if a couple of plants go down and they need to cover to provide power to everybody, um, they can buy from the wholesale market. And so when I'm talking wholesale, I'm talking at the ERCOT market level, not at a like more retail level. And then, but I will ask, like, I will just note that like there is this like in between that I don't really know the answer to when you're not in a service territory or like these bigger providers. Um, so I need to find that answer, get a better answer for you there. So like a big old data center that isn't in a service territory that builds it, like who did, and they can choose their own company. I'm not sure how that works. Alan had another question on the Q and A side. Uh, how, do we know how they converted spruce quickly to gas when they are in their estimate and their flexible path resource plan? They say it's going to take forty million dollars to convert. 
uh, I don't know the answer to that. I will say this, that um, any modern-ish coal plant uses gas as their startup fuel. So with that, I think it gets the boilers hot and ready to go to cook so that coal doesn't sit cold for very long. Um, maybe they were just running it like that. I bet it was really inefficient because uh, good point. Because what they'll do is they'll, they'll do some conversions on a boiler on a boiler and maybe some of the pipeline infrastructure to do a permanent conversion. But my guess is that um, that they were just effectively using it as a startup like fuel that they didn't ever finish starting up. But I, that is a total just like guess. Cool comment from Julian um, on just putting these sentiments together uh, as a coalition, as a community. Uh, a lot of people are having this conversation, obviously. Uh, I was taking notes earlier today. We've got this recording that we'll be sharing with other orgs um, to extend uh, that conversation, but but I agree, and and I know that um, at least updating like priorities through CASA, at least coming to I think one of the main things I hope to accomplish is uh, we had began a conversation about taking this coal retirement scenario and forcing CPS back to the table. We had a commitment from some elected leaders to make sure that that CPS had to answer you know our questions and to make alternative scenarios. So right now we're talking about, they have this coal retirement you know, report uh, with kind of like bad, they're, they're, the way I think they've organized it is it seems to be intentionally to, to make uh, renewables look more expensive than they would be or make that transition look impractical for people in San Antonio who have already been running out, uh, to be clear by COVID, by, by, by in legacies of the brutality of the economy at this place. Um, and, uh, but, but I think we can get now, certainly get that table, crack that open and start running these scenarios and start getting, making sure we can have clean, safe energy for everyone and the investment in the community to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. And that's, that's where we want this conversation to move. Um, Eloisa getting off, couldn't find the rack webpage anymore. I thought. This is it. Um, if you're still on Eloisa, I thought I put it in the in the chat. This is the rack web page. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so if you're interested again, like I just say it again. Um, oh, Julian, you're back in. We we're just saying all the nice things about you. Um, if you're interested in that rack stuff, let us know because those appointments are going to be made um, probably at the end of this month. We'll see. But I really appreciate everybody coming in here and I'll, I'll mute and uh, and go off, but uh, let folks kind of just finish the conversation. Oh, okay, it's not found when I went to, okay. Anything more for Chrissy? The link works that you shared. Okay, good. I'm all like my brain's like, the link? That <laughs> <laughs> I don't, Greg, I don't know if we can get, um, oh. Cause it's not like zoom. I don't think, I don't think we can get like a attendance so I can email out links, but I think most, most folks we know, like send it to their, um, in other words, most people are on this call through basically through invitation. So I'll, I'll try to gather some informational links. Um, if people want to learn some more, um, yeah. And, I, I think that would be super helpful, Chrissy, cause I think there's also interest in translating it into Spanish. Um, cool. so folks could better understand it and also kind of understand that, you know, if they didn't think energy democracy was part of their lives, they do now. Um, and I think that's a definitely an important piece. So I thank you for um, all the information you shared and I'm down to help with any translation. Okay, great. I'll, I'll pull together some resources in the next day or so and um, get out some links because there's like I said, and I wasn't kidding, like th there's some really, really helpful like Twitter feeds. Some of them are a little too wonky, but um, some of them are just really great. And I'll, I'll try to find those too. Meredith has her hand up. Yeah, go for it, Meredith. Um, so this is a slightly different question. Maybe Greg or, or someone uh, local might know, but I had raised some concerns uh, not only about the calendar that they're talking about for the rate committee, 
but also about the uh, ways by which they could enforce some very uh, inappropriate um, restrictions on, um, on the uh, rates committee. Is there any chance we could negotiate this stuff as soon as possible and try to get them to change how they uh, frame it? For example, there's, there's no way in the world that we're gonna come up with a decent rate structure if they're only meeting quarterly. And uh, I, another issue that I think is really important has to do with what do you do when a member um, who is very a, a very uh, active member but then gets sick and can't, can't attend, is there some way that we could have proxies who, who would be paying attention from the beginning and then step in if somebody becomes too sick to be able to continue? Yeah, I could say that those are issues that have been presented at least at a in context of a CPS meeting during public comment and uh, have shared some of that with the mayor's office. But I think we're on a slippery slope here out of the intent of this hour with Chrissy uh, and, and this, uh, this uh, climate event into uh, specifics of the Iraq. We could go a long way down that hole, okay. but I think what we need is a follow-up conversation specific to the Iraq. And I shared earlier, prior to this call with coalition partners, we have about a dozen folks who have applied, who are interested in serving or be working with. And we do want to make sure that that process is as open and transparent as possible. My understanding is that they're going to be live streaming and all that's going to be a public process. So, uh, but we can follow up on that for sure. That's a good, good question. Chrissy, you want to call it? Yeah, we can call it. And Alan had another question, but I can follow up with him. And my answer to that is no. Um, to that, no. That's what I say. No, Alan. I say because uh, their equipment fails too, and sometimes the the coal gets too wet. So. Okay. Um, doesn't work. So. Yeah. Follow up. Hit Chrissy up with more questions, uh, and we'll try to best to respond. And I'll support each other and folks have needs, then let them be known. And uh, I'll save this chat, we'll save this video. And um, I hope folks can stay warm tonight. I feel like we're moving in the next 48 hours. We'll be back up to 70 degree weather soon. Uh, and then we'll be in summer and it's gonna be 110 for a month in a row. And we're gonna be talking about the next climate crisis. Uh, so we need to be, be there. We need to be here for there. <laughs> so. A lot of respect and appreciation for those who showed up tonight and have taken on this on your heart. Stay safe, y'all. Oh, I hear you. Who's that on uh, 210? Oh, uh, this is Male. Hey, Male. just want to say thank you for holding this space, this conversation, and, and it was a lot of uh, great information and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to building, continuing to build and um, within our coalitions and um, cool. this is just like, yeah, I mean there's just so much to say there's so much in my heart but I'm thankful for it's this hard. space. It's, yeah open it up and it starts to spell out, right um, it's good to hear your voice and okay. now I know now I'll be after you, uh, we'll get we'll get some good work done of course, of course yeah, people are angry. Hopefully more people will um, join. You know, this will be their opportunity to join in on the struggle, yeah. you know, because a lot of people who are affected and, uh, I mean, we got to meet with our neighbors, you know, and hopefully this is an opportunity for people to, like, you know, build some, you know, like, know who is actually there to to care and support for each other, you know, like, who was there, you know, yeah. when we need the most. And so hopefully this is going to, you know, I feel to the flame, the movement, the change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, to create different systems that are necessary to sustain us. But Absolutely. Yeah. Great comment. Thank you. I'm trying to, did, I'm not able to save this chat. I don't know why. Um, I don't see the save chat option. Um, but I guess follow up, you know, with, with one of us and we'll we'll do our best to follow up with y'all. Definitely. Yeah, great. and there's a lot of folks, you know, uh, doing great work. Thank you, Deceleration and Swo Society of Native Nations. There's a lot of folks helping out the homeless, you know, and I guess for those on the call. 
us to remember, you know, those, those, our house's community and, and to be able to give back, you know, they're, they're out there and they need wood and blankets and coffee in the morning if I uh, have time, you know, like yeah. if we have the, if y'all have the resources and, um, the ability. Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, Society of Native Nations, for sure. I've been watching a little bit on, on your uh, Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, would you, uh, if there's something that I can help promote, will you let me know, Male? Yeah, of course, of course, remotely. I think Ana Juan Arbolarios también is looking for volunteers okay. uh, for their um, dispatch center because there are a lot of folks trying to help each other right now. And so uh, we're receiving a lot of, uh, you know, calls. And so there's different ways people can help. And um, even with donations, you know, towards these um, folks doing mutual aid, right? Yeah. We have to, um, you know, just, yeah, support each other in that way. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Lots of great organizations. Uh, I know, yeah. Yanawana Arbolarios and... Um, even the new youth, the new generation of leaders are coming through and bringing their collectives. And so we need to engage, have intergenerational, you know, uh, tables and, uh, you know, and, you know, just, yeah, just reach out in those different, on those different uh, spheres of influence that we all have. Let's get a, a big town town hall together. Mm -hmm. Let's bring it all together. Um, Thank uh, you for your time. It. Yeah, yeah. Yana Wana showed up. We had uh, someone in distress um, and they showed up and got, I mean, this in a big way. So um, a lot of respect for their work and, uh -huh. and yours as well. So, Igualmente. Okay. All right. Thanks.